This was proposed in 2006 and has largely flown under the radar. Sentient World Simulation is a matrix-like reality simulating humanity. We talk often about the quantum computers, the kind of ability they've got to map and model humanity itself because of this internet of things that is all around us now as well. We're feeding all of our information back into this quantum computer that's basically got a virtual world where all of us have a digital avatar in there. They're able to manipulate the digital avatar in a virtual world and that's actually translated to effects in the real world. You cannot compromise. You cannot negotiate. You cannot surrender to a computer. It will continue to do what it is programmed to do. What might be behind this digital enslavement? Um, but if you think that virtual reality and living in a simulation uh, is just too far off, totally unreal, well, that is exactly what the United States government has been working on. Throughout my childhood, I'd always known of a facility called the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, located in the city adjacent to my own. It was looked at in the community as just a research facility where a lot of smart scientists worked on nuclear developments and other important technological initiatives. Well, earlier this year, my brother and I started researching nuclear weapons testing and what the psychological impacts were when we took nuclear testing into a virtual space. And as our investigation unfolded, we found that the Livermore Lab has built an impressive greenwashing PR campaign that cloaks a much more sinister reality. Behind me in this relatively ordinary looking building is one of the fastest, largest artificial intelligence computers in the world. It's called Sierra, a very different kind of supercomputer than ever before. Lawrence Livermore is starting to work with IBM in a partnership and collaboration to explore how the IBM True North neuromorphic chip is going to be able to be applied to problems in the national interest. These custom designed chips and the classified software are creating detailed computer simulations to a level never seen before. It's actually the unique design architecture configured specifically to run artificial intelligence that is the breakthrough. Robots the smartest people. Artificial intelligence, AI. The idea is to port the software from the human brain. Rather than hardware and software, they're actually going to a new form of software, and that is the biological replacement of the human brain functioning as a quantum computer, biologically, and then loading people, integrating people into this new form of brain. It is called the Sentient World Simulation. The program's aim, according to its creator, is to be a continuously running, continually updated mirror model of the real world that can be used to predict and evaluate future events and courses of action. In practical terms, that equates to a computer simulation of the entire planet, complete with billions of nodes representing every person on the Earth. Right now, we're inside a computer program. Is it really so hard to believe? It's actually a system of computers, of conscious computers with a will and token emotion of their own. Now, it's really not their own. It's the bio-algorithms which make up the, the bio-algorithms which make up the will, intellect, and emotion of those that they've copied and destroyed. We've been talking about artificial intelligence for decades. It started in the science fiction realm and has grown into reality. Specifically, we are looking to see how we can tackle uh, simulation modeling problems uh, and pattern recognition classification inference problems across the national security space, but in particular in the fields that the ASC or Advanced Simulation and Computing program is tasked to explore and develop. At the time of initial reports on the program, there were only 62 country-level simulations being run by the U.S. Department of Defense. These simulations grouped humans into composites, with 100 individuals acting as a single node. But already at that time, the U.S. Army had used the systems to create a one-to-one -one level simulation of potential Army recruits. It's the stuff of a Hollywood movie, but a group of veterans has filed a lawsuit against the CIA and U.S. Army claiming that the government planted remote control devices in their brains. The claims relate to a government program at the U.S. Army's Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. Mind transfer, mind copying, whole brain emulation, except for the purposes of you know, you know, creating a cognitive model of the victim's brain. The ultimate aim would be to archive enough data on each individual to be able to make a computer model of everyone on the planet. These custom designed chips and the classified software are creating detailed computer simulations to a level never seen before. 
They can study biology all the way down to the individual atoms, the hydrogens, the atomic levels, down all the way down there. They are doing DNA surveys from space. So what happens is you get these nanoparticles that attach to our DNA. And when they do, they act as receivers. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, not a month goes by where I don't get a call at my institute by someone telling me that someone in the government implanted these things in their brain without them knowing. I'm not kidding. Out of disclosure, some of the work that I'm doing here today is funded by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. I'm also funded by the European Union Human Brain Project, specifically the Subproject 12, where I'm a task leader for dual-use brain science. And I've also done some ongoing work with the Strategic Multi-Level Assessment Crew over the past 10 years at the Pentagon, with Dr. Tabayan's group, and with DARPA. The military agenda is interested in the potential weaponization and misuse of the brain sciences for nefarious agenda for political intelligence and military use. The Human Genome Project was carried out at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where I was a staff scientist for five years. The DNA is what they're using what they're focusing on and what they're weaponizing to completely control us. And uh, this is a completely new technology that, like the Morganons, is light-based. It's like building a little computer by uh, using these uh, single units DNA is built out of. So what happens is you get these nanoparticles that attach to our DNA. And when they do, they act as receivers. If you're not aware of what nanoparticulate matter is, it's that matter which exists on a scale of one times 10 to the minus ninth. Very, very small. Smaller than a cell. The idea here is to be able to read and write into the brain function in real time, remotely. There are those that think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. The last sanctified space is that of my consciousness, and you're using this stuff to invade that? You're right. The brain sciences are currently being used in such endeavors, not only domestically, but worldwide. What has gone from the drawing board to the reality is this, the use of neural interfacing and physiological interfacing through the idea of remote controlled small scale systems to create a nano swarm of biopenetrable materials that you cannot see, that can penetrate all but the most robust biochemical filters that are able to integrate themselves through a variety of membranes, mucous membranes in wherever, mouth, nose, ears, eyes, and they can be done in such a level that their presence is almost impossible to detect, and as such, the attribution becomes exceedingly difficult to demonstrate. The idea here is to be able to read and write into the brain function in real time, remotely. What we know about Google is that they are doing DNA surveys from space. And of course they're being joined by Lawrence Livermore National Labs. They have, get this, high fidelity neural recordings. They're trying to do everything they can to map and to record your memory. It's not enough for them to record all of our metadata, not enough for them to record all of our phone conversations as the former head of the NSA said. He said they want total population control. That's how you do it with these brain projects. So what happens is you get these nanoparticles that attach to our DNA. And when they do, they act as receivers. The DNA has a unique frequency and signal. That is what they're using, what they're focusing on, and what they're weaponizing to completely control us. And although it may not be that the sky is falling yet, folks, it looks like rain. Bring an umbrella. That said, What's going to rain down? Take a look. This is the front of my pen. This amount of nanomaterial, if be able to maintain and sustain with regard to its deliverability and aerosolization, could in fact affect all of you. The nanotechnology and the biotechnology filters down from the hydrosphere into the water supply and the food chain. And now every, every American, all 318 million Americans are, are infected. It can be activated, the nanotechnology, from thousands of miles away using a process called directed energy flashing, photons. Okay? They illumine the brain of the, uh, brain of the victim with photons and re read the return training signal. That's how the technology can be activated in a specific target's uh, uh, brain. And it seems to be on a grid system so they're doing a survey from space, and they went down 
uh, the west coast of South America and then came up the east coast and now they're in Southeast Asia. At the time of initial reports on the program, there were only 62 country-level simulations being run by the U.S. Department of Defense. These simulations grouped humans into composites, with 100 individuals acting as a single node. But already at that time, the U.S. Army had used the systems to create a one-to-one -one level simulation of potential Army recruits. It's the stuff of a Hollywood movie, but a group of veterans has filed a lawsuit against the CIA and U.S. Army claiming that the government planted remote control devices in their brains. The claims relate to a government program at the U.S. Army's Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. And the sentient world simulation, SWS, went live in 2007, which represents every person on the planet within this computer matrix as a node and every node is given an avatar an identifier and that is real-time 24 7 monitoring of every person on the planet this is primarily but not exclusively facilitated by the adiabatic quantum computers produced by D-Wave Corporation. It, it comes down to a kind of system that resembles uh, old-fashioned telephone system you have like dial-in codes and each frequency you give in, like do 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 every frequency you give in is switching on one single DNA element, making it open to take the next step. So basically what you can do with it is um, creating s s synthetic DNA or RNA that is possible to be activated with a dial-in sequence of frequencies. All they need is to, to kind of identify your DNA fingerprint like <laughs> uh, with your name and then they can, they can watch you 24 hours a day. This is one part. The other part so is... So we, we are running a GPS system? Yes. If you construct a model of the human brain, you can then plug people into this hive mind. So, nano diamonds being used for an MRI is exactly the same process of third strand of DNA nanoparticles that are receivers, just like in the MRI discussion here, they are receivers of the overhauser effect signals for the purpose of mapping the human brain or the whole body in the hospital. But this is exactly the same ultra-low field MRI regime that is used to activate the third strand of DNA. As an insider with detailed information of this entire fucking program and how it works from top to bottom, I am privy to uh, some details that most are not. And that is that the true way that this technology works is that a complete DNA profile is obtained from the target, from the individual, the targeted individual. And then this information, the DNA of the individual, is used to determine the resonant frequency of the DNA itself. The resonant frequency is then used to fine tune the technology, the radio frequency signals, the microwave auditory effect, and all the other aspects of the technology to tune it perfectly to the resonant frequency of the targeted individual's DNA. They are changing the spin of quantum particles in the mind. That's how the mind control operates. And it, it's important that people know the specific mechanisms that are taking place so that you see that this is real, this is tangible, this is provable evidence of what is going on. You know, people want to say conspiracy theorists. Well, we don't do that. We take the papers, the peer-reviewed papers, we take the articles of the hard science, we give you the technical nuts and bolts. And this all comes out of particle physics, folks. This is all about particle colliders, synchrotron particle accelerators, hard x-rays, looking at our DNA, looking at the proteins building the DNA, using these hard x-rays to infer their quantum construction uh, patterns, their models. They do all of this in computer software, and now they're applying that same DNA process to the minds in order to, down at that you know, tubulin dimer level, 
be able to model exactly the electrical pathways, the electron flow within our human brains from neuron to neuron, across synapse connections, all of those things across the dendrites. Everything is being modeled biologically. The researchers decided to create a quantum version of a neural network using an approach known as Variation Quantum Eigensolver, VQE, whereby instead of programming each computer in traditional bits, you have a single binary value of 0 or 1. The computers are trained to model quantum data using quantum bits or qubits that can be in superposition so each qubit can have the value of 1 and 0 at the same time. And the Manhattan Project gave us the atomic bomb. The Genome Project gave us the human genome. The third great initiative could be the Connectome Project to map the entire human brain. And that may take a quantum computer. Um, understand that carbon is a conductive medium. So it can both send and receive signals. And that is exactly why the microtubules of our brains are composed of these Buckminster Fullerene microtubules is because they absorb signals, electromagnetic signals, and they transmit them. And that includes photons. And that's the primary vehicle of transmitting data from DNA, which is your are your memories. The data within the DNA is transferred within the brain and processed within the brain because that's all the brain is. It is not a storage medium. It is a processor. And this means communications could be done mentally. What I'm saying is that the internet will be replaced by brain net. The true holy grail in terms of this technology is DNA resonant frequency. It taps right into the DNA and it does it remotely by resonating with the exact frequency that your DNA resonates. DNA comprises our brains. It produces our brains. They are doing exactly what they did with DNA with a human brain. The mind operates on multiple frequency levels, but I'm going to just give you one specific, okay? The luminosity resulting from the collision of subatomic particles in the colliders inside the detectors at CERN produce identical frequencies as to the mind. Again, the mind has multiple frequencies, but they are reproducing through collisions, collisions of particles two of the frequencies within which the mind operates. And you better believe that they're operating at all of the various frequency ranges, alpha and beta ranges of the mind. Does that mean that CERN is, directed, is, is directing mind control systems? No, it means that they're doing the research and development that is then applied to the supercomputer systems like D-Wave for the purpose of, in the environment of the sentient world simulation, for the purpose of controlling people's minds. Once you have connected the targeted individual with the frequency um, and they resonate together, then you have a perfect uh, avenue upon which to send and receive information back and forth. And that's exactly how they manipulate someone's thoughts. They send voices into someone's head. Uh, they manipulate their emotions. They manipulate their behavior. And then that's also how they receive back from the in individual in real time uh, the vital signs, the emotions, the thoughts, uh, what the person's seeing, what the person's hearing. And then all that information, of course, is rendered on a computer elsewhere uh, via software, and it can be monitored and tracked in real time. It's horrible. It's horrifying. And it is a crime against humanity. This is something that needs to be dealt with in the Geneva Convention. This is something that needs to be dealt with in international courts. This is something that needs to be dealt with first and foremost by the Supreme Court of the United States. This is something that needs to be dealt with until we get to that point at the local and the state level. This is something that needs to be tackled by lawyers and civil rights advocates immediately. We need laws right fucking now to stop this thing because it is out of control and it is only getting worse. The entire public
population of the United States of America could conceivably be controlled by this. And I know for a fact, having been an insider and actually been a part of this program and seen it operate on a day-to-day -day basis, I am aware that there are now entire cities in America that are nothing more but a massive social engineering experiment. How are they implementing this? The people who developed it say it is airborne since 2003. And I had once I had the occasion to have a, a short look into those papers. I don't hold them. I'm not the one to publish them. If somebody decides to publish it, somebody completely else. I don't even know. But I had the possibility to have a look in. And I do, did some research to verify if the things I saw there are realistic. Hmm. It is sprayed by airplanes as well. It is brought into a form where it can stand the temperatures in the uh, back part of a jet engine hot air stream. So it's, it's able to survive temperatures. I don't know how they do it. And then it's airborne and basically it's all over the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. I've got no clue. And the, the, the difficult thing about this is there is full proof out there somewhere, but the people who hold these papers and who hold the papers brought out by one whistleblower that didn't like, actually at the end of his days, he didn't like what he was doing uh, during the last years of his life, so he, he decided to talk. The people who, who hold these papers, they don't know what to do with it, because this is a, basically it's, it's kind of hopeless, because this is out there and it's very complex and there's no medication against it. There's nothing one can do. So this holds people back to, to even talk about it in public. I'm sorry, but that is unacceptable. It is your job to protect the American people. It is your job to investigate high crimes and felonies that have been committed by the people that have been entrusted with the safe keeping of this country, our constitution and the American people. Unfortunately, what's happening in America today is all of the people who have been charged with our protection have fallen asleep at the wheel. They have failed to live up to their oath and either through complicity or complacency, they are either making or allowing this nightmare to occur on American soil. All it takes for evil to prosper is for good people to do nothing. And that is exactly what's happening today. As people who are crying out to family members and friends, to local law enforcement and the FBI, to their government, their military, to the private corporations who are involved in this for help are being met with silence or even worse ridicule they're being accused of being crazy they're being accused of being paranoid and schizophrenic to completely cover up what is in fact a social engineering program and a covert research and development program for some of the most sophisticated and advanced technology that the world has ever seen so the situation we're faced with ladies and gentlemen is as follows as we begin to untangle the Gordian knot of the brain through the development of neuroscience and technologies, we've come to the precarious position of opening the proverbial can of worms of if, how, in what ways, to what extent, and when these techniques and technologies will be used in weaponized intelligence and national security agenda. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that can has already been opened. It'll be our job, and increasingly your job, to be able to navigate this new terrain, this brave new world, and what it incurs.